Lord, that is, uh, let that be true for each and every one of us tonight. As we come in with so many different things that we ask for, Lord, so many different things that we're, we're hoping for, for, for you to do, for you to take care of, Lord, but at the end of the day that we would not resign ourselves, but we would be content, Lord, in you. No matter what your answer is, Lord. No matter what your answer is, Lord, that we would continue to seek for more of you, Jesus. Jesus, we need more of you. Lord, we give you praise, and I just ask that you would just help us tonight to turn our hearts fully to you so that we can seek, we can ask, we can seek, and we can step out and knock in faith for just all of you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you, you guys. When John's gone like a ninja, he closed my eyes, he just disappears. <laughs> oh, that's good. Very sneaky for six foot four. <laughs> oh, testimony time. Does anyone want to share what God's been doing in your life? Miguel, come on up here, brother. This uh, Bob and I. Where's Bob? Bob, there you are. This is a. Uh, this is the part of the series that when we, we started the series, and I said I asked a bunch of people, "What a, what do you want to know about prayer?" You know, and this is this is the part of the series that Bob and I really were kind of on the same page as, what is it? Uh, uh, what, what do we do when God doesn't answer prayers right away, or He doesn't answer them the way we want, or maybe He doesn't answer them at all in our perspective? What does that mean? How do we step into that? And uh, um, man, tonight's message couldn't come at a more frustrating time for me. <laughs> I was giving the scriptures to Jason over the phone today. I had to hang up on him. I said, "I'll call you right back." And I just, I just bawled like a baby for about fifteen minutes before I called him back. I, uh, I, I, I'm not going to pretend to have any uh, answers tonight. I just want to present some things. I'm doing something I've never done before. Uh, <laughs> I typed. <laughs> uh, because I, uh, I didn't know if I could get through this message in all honesty, with what um, with what the last week and Friday night looked like. And so and the title is Our Cries in the Context of the Classroom um, and what it looks like when we're crying out to God and He takes us through a season of, of teaching and training. Because um, we've talked so much as we've gone through the Lord's Prayer of the, the Lord's heart to want to do things for us, the Lord's heart to want to to heal and to provide um, and yet sometimes we, we cry out in the midst of our struggles and it seems like uh, uh, it seems like we, we get nothing. And I just wanted to kind of go over some of those things. And I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm not using my notes and that's why I typed them. So if, if you bear with me, be a little patient with me. Now I'm just going to do more reading than preaching as normal. I know because some of you guys talk about it. You never look at your notes. You just storm around the stage just yelling and... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to read tonight so that I can, I don't know, I'm just going to read. These are some of my thoughts that I have concerning this subject. God teaches us His truth so He can test us unto failure. God teaches us His truth so that He can test us unto failure. We fail the test concerning truth every time when we, in our independence, trust the ideas of truth alone. We succeed every time when we, in dependence of Him, trust the person of truth, Jesus. God is not in the business of doing His will our way. 
I think sometimes we come, Jason gave a wonderful message on God's will, praying God's will as we looked at the Lord's Prayer and, you know, Lord, your will be done. But but sometimes that, that's as far as we take it. The truth is, is we may pray that and we actually have a heart's desire for the Lord's will to be done, but we want the Lord's will to be done our way. Yes, I want people to come to salvation, but I want it done my way. God, I want healing, but I want it to be done my way. God, I want I want my finances to be right. I want to be able to honor you with all of my finances and be able to be a giver like you called me to be, but I want to do it my way, in my circumstances, my control, my understanding. I want to do it my way. I want to do your will my way. And to really look at God's will is that he is not in the business of doing his will our way. It is not enough to know his will, to know about it, to know what God wants to do. You must also know him. This is the essence and the very purpose of prayer, is to come and know God and his will from within his heart. And so when we pray, it's not just know his will empirically to, to be able to state it or look for it, but it's to know his will from within his very heart, from the place of his heart. Prayer is the alignment of our will to his as he leads us in the dance of intimacy within himself. Oswald Chambers and his utmost my utmost for his highest, Oswald Chambers, yearly devotional. My dad has given me, I think, four of these. <laughs> he will come and he's like, Caleb, have you ever read Oswald Chambers? My utmost for his highest. I'm like, yeah, dad, I have. You've, you've given me like three or four. He's like, well, I found this really cool one out of garage. So do you want it? And I'm like, sure. This one's not mine even. I have four of them and I didn't even know where I could find one of my own. This is Jason's. Today is August 28th. In August 28th, kid you not, this is what Oswald Chambers has for today. Luke 11, 1. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And it struck me as I was reading this that this is really one of the only things the disciples actually ask Jesus to teach. They ask him to clarify parables, but this is the only thing they say, hey, Lord, teach us, show us, train us, teach us what it is to pray. Oswald Chambers has this in response. Prayer is not a normal part of the life of the natural man. We hear it said that a person's life will suffer if he doesn't pray, but I question that. What will suffer is the life of the Son of God in him, which is nourished not by food, but by prayer. When a person is born again from above, the life of the Son of God is born in him, and he can either starve or nourish that life. Prayer is the way that the life of God in us is nourished. Our common ideas regarding prayer are not found in the New Testament. We look upon prayer simply as a means of getting things for ourselves. But the biblical purpose of prayer is that we may get to know God himself. Ask and you shall receive, it says in John 16, 24. We complain before God and sometimes we are apologetic or indifferent to him, but we actually ask him for very few things. Yet a child exhibits a magnificent boldness to ask. Our Lord said, unless you become like little children in Matthew 18, 3. Ask and God will do. Give Jesus Christ the opportunity and the room to work. The problem is not the problem is that no one will ever do this until he is at his wit's end. When a person is at his wit's end, it is no longer it no longer seems to be a cowardly thing to pray. In fact, it is the only way he can get in touch with the truth and the reality of God Himself. Be yourself before God and present him with your problems. The very things that have brought you to your wit's end. But as long as you think you are self-sufficient, you do not need to ask God for anything. To say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying prayer changes me and then I change things. God has established things so that prayer on the basis of redemption changes the way a person looks at things. Prayer is not a matter of changing things externally, but one of working miracles in a person's inner nature. Jesus gives us this directive to pray. Pray then like this, and we've been going over that since we started this series. We must pray. He demands it. He awaits it. He's given us everything to complete our office of prayer, our work of prayer. It is Him Himself. He is our righteousness, and the power of His Spirit that He gives us is our ability to intercede. If God was just going to do everything on his own without co-laborship with us, his church, then why does he ask us to pray and partake in the solution? Why is everything in the Lord's Prayer 
something that we do not yet experience fully? Why after the saving exchange of our lives for Christ are we left on this earth? We join in God's redemptive plan, the plan He has had since the beginning. We can only join through Jesus and we can only know what to do through prayer and through His Word led by God's Spirit. God's vision, His will, His desire, His strategy, and His expectations are laid out in His Word. But His tactics and power is only found in prayer. Prayer that is filled with faith. God delights in seeing his children carry out his will. That is why he has called us to be the bearers of the good news, to be the messengers of his grace and his peace, to be healers, to be people who extend your creative nature that God gave you so that the world can become exactly how God created it. God calls us to pray so that we would know more about his plan for this this world, His plan for redemption, so that we can actively partake in that redemption. Prayer is not a passive thing that we do. It is a highly active, interactive, and effectively powerful thing that we engage in so that we can do the very things God called us and created us for. True prayer brings God glory and praise, and it reveals God's will for His church, and it releases power for her, His church, to be like Him, Jesus Christ bringing the church joy, strength, and provision. And it also destroys the works of the enemy so to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And in doing so, that brings forth opportunities for us to share the gospel to those who are far from him so that they may come to salvation, hope, and life in Christ. Our prayer is the foundation in which all things we are called to do must be done out of. Nothing is done without prayer. Watchman Nee says God will do nothing on his own until his saints pray that He wills it, He speaks it out. We see this in Ezekiel 36 and in Isaiah 55, this idea of God saying, here are my promises, here's what I'm going to do, but I'm going to give my promises to my people, not so that they would just simply accomplish Him, but that they would return those promises in prayer to me so that my word would go forth. Isaiah 55 says that my word goes out from my mouth, but it does not return to me void. Well, who's returning God's word? Am I returning the word, the promises, and the guarantees of God the Father? Or am I letting them sit idle on the surface of the earth? It's so wonderful when God answers our prayers. It's such a beautiful thing that when the Lord of the universe, we cry out and we pray for something, and He responds with affirmation, and He just blows us away. Such rejoicing when we see this. I mean, we, and, and when God does this, He's always trying to bring glory to Himself. We see this when we look at Luke 17. Um, I'm sorry, when we look at John 9, 1 through 3, there's a man born blind from birth. I mean, he's <laughs> a little redundant. Sorry. Man born blind. And the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, Who sinned, this man or his parents, who was born blind? And Jesus said, Neither. Neither sinned. This was done so that the Father would be glorified, and he made the man well. Likewise, when Jesus answers prayers, it's, it's often because of his compassion, his, his desire for us to be whole and healthy in, in, the, in the perfection of the creation he intended us to be. Constantly we see in the scriptures that it says that Jesus would see people and he would have compassion on them. He would release compassion, the love of the Father on people. You know, sympathy is soothing and sympathy gives a, a lending ear and is nice. But compassion loves and compassion acts unto healing. Thirdly, we see in Luke 17 that God's answer to prayer is God's healing, His provision. Everything He does when we cry out to Him is to always to lead people into salvation. And we're going to really hammer that next week. He, sa- he heals ten lepers all Samaritans, and they take off, and he says, you'll be healed as you go. And as they go, they start to get healed. And one realizing it comes back and and praises Jesus. And Jesus says, where are the other nine? Wasn't there ten of you that I healed? And and the man praises God, and Jesus says, "Uh, because of your thankfulness and your faith, you have been saved. God's healing power, His answer to prayer is not just for us to feel better, to have an easier life, for us to continue living the way we want. He answers prayers because He wants to use our testimony, our lives, unto the glory of God and the salvation of the lost. And I I fear there's been too many prayers in my life that God has answered that I have allowed, I have allowed to just become 
personal enjoyments with no benefit to anyone else. But often we pray and it doesn't seem like God answers or He answers late or He says no or it doesn't work out the way we want. And tonight I want to look at some of those reasons to why this happens, but not all the reasons. And when I give, there's six reasons, six kind of fundamental ideas that I'm going to kind of cover very quickly tonight. And they're in your insert. I, the, the, the major points of them, the six points are in your insert and, and I have scriptures for them. But this is, this is not an exhaustive or a conclusive list. And as Pastor Mike says all the time, that God is always doing more than one thing when he does one thing. And this is so true that so often the, the lessons that we're taught as we, as we do not receive the answers for our prayers immediately or they come in a different form that we would like or they don't come at all, that the reason for that, they're not coming, and the lessons that we learn in that season is usually multiple things at once. And so what I'm, what I'm saying this for right now is as we get into these six reasons of why God doesn't answer prayer, or He doesn't answer it the way we want or delays, is that it's not formulaic. God is not a God in which you plug into a formula, you find a reason, you plug the reason in, and poof, you get what you want as a return. But these are things for us to use as a foundation to search out the heart of God deeper, to know more of who He is, to really have that intimacy, that, that, that dance of a relationship with Him where He leads us in everything. So many of these points are going to overlap, and the lessons within them will overlap in our lives. And, and they're there to draw us to Christ to draw us to Him, to know Him more. Number one, His will. His will, not ours, but ours in alignment with His. This has so much to do with our need for submission so that we can hear His voice clearly and not our own thoughts and our desires. To understand Him and to understand the particular need that he is looking to meet, the particular work he is looking to do, the particular thing he is wanting to accomplish. To understand God's will is to first understand not only what he wants done, but also the way in which he wants it done. The love and the mercy, the fruit of the Spirit. And so understanding God's will is the first place that we land. Matthew 6, 9, like I said, Jason, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord said, Your kingdom come, your will be done. And in 1 John 15, I did not mark that. 1 John uh, chapter 5, 14 and 15. John recounts the words of the Lord. Um, I'm sorry. And this is the confidence that we have towards Him. He's speaking of Jesus. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So if we're praying according to God's will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we're asking, we know that we have the request that we ask of Him. And so there's this promise for God to respond when we're praying according to His will. And again, it's not just to understand it. It's just not the understanding, it, but it's for us to align our wills and our very actions, the faith of our lives in accordance to His will. Willingly. His will must be aligned with willingly. There is a relationship there that cannot be understated, that we can know His will and say, yes, Lord, Your will be done, but a begrudging heart, the Lord's not going to force us often into things that we don't want to do. He will let us wander the desert of our own will and determination for as long as necessary until we are broken of it. And so often when we pray to God and we, we aren't hearing from God, part of the problem can be is that our will is not willingly aligned with His it may be aligned in thought and understanding, but it is not willingly aligned with His for the joy of His glory, the church, and the lost. This idea of not being alignment brings us right into our second point is our sin. You see, anything done not in faith is sinful. Sinful in the idea of missing the mark or having a debt to God. In other words, basically, our sin isn't, we always think of sin, or not we always, but oftentimes we can think of sin as this deep, dark thing we did. You know, like Miguel talked about what happened to his sister. We think about murder. We think about genocide. We think about these atrocities to other human beings as sins. But the very rebellion against God's will is sin. The very fact that you know what God wants to do and you choose to do anything other than that is sin. It's missing the mark. It's not doing what God has called you to do. And so as we look at our sin, we have to understand that our sin hampers our ability to pray with God. First Peter 5, Peter talks about this. Or rather, First Peter 
3, 5, 11, talks about this idea that we, we must be self-controlled, sober-minded, that obeying God for the sake of our prayers. That the sin in our life affects our prayers. And this should be, this should be really kind of a duh thing for us. The fact is the sin in our life separated us from God completely. So even though we're saved by grace and the blood of Jesus gets us salvation and we're righteous before God, our relationship with him is still based. You can't have a relationship with someone and say you love them and that you're on their side if you're constantly rebelling against them, talking bad about them, doing the opposite things that they want you to do. Sin in our life is a huge roadblock to our ability to hear God clearly and in our ability to trust that God is going to respond. He may hear, but he may not respond because he'll have no part with our sin. Whatever it is, no matter how good it feels or how much society tells us it's okay, the world is telling us that this is something the Bible doesn't really effectively speak to this in our day in society. It doesn't understand. I don't care. Our sin separates us from God. Primarily our unforgiveness. And we talked about this. This is why the Lord hit on this more than anything. His, his, his teaching of prayer is that our unforgiveness, if we cannot have right relationship with people we see and interact with, we cannot have a right relationship with a God that we don't see. It's just that simple. If we're harboring unforgiveness, it, it, it's Jesus said, if you have a gift on the altar and you re recognize that your brother has something against you, you've wronged your brother, so you need repentance, or that you are harboring judgment on someone else, that you need to leave that gift on the altar. Your praise, your worship, your, your giving, anything that you think you're giving to benefit the glory of God, to fulfill the calling on your life, to work out your, your, your calling in your life, you need to lay it on the altar and make it right with your brother or sister before you can come back and have right relationship with God. This is so critical. If we cannot have right relationship, if we cannot, at least on our side of our responsibility, present ourselves for reconciliation to those that we have hurt or who have hurt us, we cannot expect to have a conversation of reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. Peter went in and even said, the husbands, you need to honor your wives. You need to honor your wives for the sake of your prayers. This relationship thing is huge. Mike's honoring Lisa right now. I can see it. <laughs> honoring each other. The first commandment in the Old Testament that had to do with our relationship with one another was children, honor your parents so that you may prosper and live long in the land. The promises of God, the life that God has for you is uniquely tied to our ability to honor one another. Particularly those relationships that you are closest with the husband and wife and the parents and the children. And it goes out from there, not lessening, in its, not lessening in the amount of honor you should give, but those relationships have a certain tie. They have a certain reflection of the relationship of the father with us, the husband with his bride, the church. And so those relationships are so important for us to make sure we have honor and right relationship with, no matter what the cost on our end. James says the prayer of a righteous man will availeth much. It's very powerful. And righteousness doesn't mean that, oh, I haven't sinned in a week, therefore my prayer meter is filling up. My power meter, man, I haven't sinned in a week. I'm going to, every time I open my mouth, heavens are opened. <laughs> righteousness is, is us following Jesus by faith. A righteous man is just as righteous the day he doesn't sin as the day that he sins and he falls on his knees before God and asks for forgiveness. He's just as righteous because it is faith that makes us righteous. And this righteousness is so important. This idea of faith, of trusting God. It brings us to our third point, which is discipline. Ooh. Discipline. Discipline is an often misunderstood concept. John talks about there's no punishment in God because punishment has to do with fear. I'm talking about judgment from God, that He's going to cut you off, He's going to punish you, that He's mad at you, that He's going to completely, every time you do wrong, He's looking to give you karma. That's not God. God does discipline, though, but He disciplines unto righteousness. He corrects to grow, not to condemn. In Hebrews 12, 
verses 4 through 13, I just want to read this to you, and then I want to hit on two words real quick before we get to the fourth point. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation, the encouragement, the challenge that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by Him. Basically being called out by God. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline, this is key, it is for discipline that you must endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons at all. Discipline and chastisement. Discipline has more of a connotation in the Greek to do with the training, a discipline, uh, the discipline actions that an athlete will undergo to accomplish the task. In other words, God will do things to his children to produce righteousness. He will put you in circumstances to challenge you and grow you like lifting weights. Unto failure is how you get stronger. If you've ever done anything athletic in your life and challenged yourself, you know that the greatest gains or growths in your skill set or your endurance or strength is when you get disciplined, when your discipline draws you to a place of training unto failure. The discipline of the Lord is so imperative because it's not about what you did wrong. It's about what He wants to show you how to do right. It's not about how you've missed the point, but He wants to show you how much of Him will fulfill the thing you are searching for. He wants to draw you into righteousness, draw you into Himself through the challenges. Now, chastisement does. That scourging. Scourging was a word they would use when they'd whip you with the cat of nine tails. In other words, when you do step out of line, God is hitting you. He is scourging you. He is disciplining you. Not punishment, not because it's bad enough, but He is driving the sin out of you. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians when a man was sleeping with his father's mother, or his father's wife, his stepmother, he says, get this man out of your midst. Don't even let this sexual immorality be talked about amongst you. Turn him over to Satan so that his flesh can be ruined, crucified, destroyed, and that hopefully he will be able to be saved in his spirit. You see, when God scourges us, when God reproves us, it is because not because he's disappointed with the creation he has made or the person that you are. He is coming after the sin in your life, not you. And the enemy always wants to twist this around. I want to make this very clear, is that when you are getting disciplined and sin is being dealt with in your life, it is not that God is disappointed or angry with you, his his child and his creation, he is angry with the sin that is in control of your life. And he is coming to show you that that sin must leave, that he has greater things. He has more for you than the thing that you are entrenched in. And so when we're praying and things don't seem to be going away, sometimes God can be disciplined. He can be growing certain characters, characteristics of himself, the fruit of the Spirit, or he might be scourging us of sin in our life. And as you can probably see already, some of these things overlap. And when God's not answering prayers because he's in the process of doing something before he gives you the blessing that you must steward. Because he doesn't want to waste his good gifts on children that squander them. Discipline is tough because discipline brings us to our wit's end. Watchman Nee tells a story of when him and a friend of his, and I believe I told this recently, so forgive me if you remember this story. Watchman Nee and a buddy of his were on the banks of a river and some friends were swimming and a man, one of their friends, was out in the middle of the river and began to drown and started crying for help and was thrashing. And Watchman Nee and one of his buddies were not very good swimmers and their third friend was a fantastic swimmer, very strong swimmer. And they go, go save him. He didn't respond. He just stood on the shore and he just watched. And they start challenging, why aren't you getting in? Oh, now I see the heart, you coward. And they start coming against the man. You, what kind of Christian are you? And they're like, why won't you? He just doesn't. And finally, the man out in the water starts to struggle less and less and less. And finally, the man dives in the water with a few quick strokes. He's out to the man in the, in the, in the river. And he pulls him back to shore with ease. And they get there, and they're, they're helping the man resuscitate and come back. And they're like, I can't believe you call yourself a Christian. You just about let that man drown. And the man calmly looks at, him, at the two men that are ridiculing him for his son. He says, you don't understand. There was so much fight in him. 
at the beginning, that if I would have swam out there, he would have overcome me and we both would have drowned. I had to let him wear himself out of himself before I could save him. So often we are in seasons of discipline in our life, seasons of being scourged by the Lord, and our prayers seem to fall silent on his ears because we are continuing to fight relentlessly in our independence, in our efforts to see things done our way instead of becoming dependent on him and just throwing our arms up and saying, Jesus, enough is enough. Whatever your will be, no matter what it looks like, I want to know what I need to learn in this season so I can move forward. And that leads us into this testing of faith, point number four. Travailing and persevering. Jesus is drawing us into himself. This idea of praying constantly. James 1 hits this off right in the beginning. Verse 2, James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is so much like discipline, but sometimes the trials, it's not God doing it, but sometimes God allows trials to happen in our life. The enemy like we see with Job, gets free reign to cause havoc. We see the enemy ask to sift Peter like wheat. We see the enemy do things in our life that he's allowed to do, and God allows these trials to happen because he wants to produce something in us. He wants to take what is bad and designed for evil and destruction and use it for endurance, perseverance, character, and growth in us. And so it's not always God that's doing it. It's not always more repentance that you need. Sometimes there is literally something else going on and God is trying to teach us to travail, to persist and pray because he's not saying, look, I'm disciplining as you go to him and you're learning more about what the Lord is saying, why this is happening. He's not saying I'm I'm trying to fix sin. He's not saying I'm trying to produce something. He's saying that you just, you need to keep praying. Sometimes we need to be praying for things to happen first before something can happen second. We see this in Daniel as he's calling on the Lord for for rescue of his people. And it takes three weeks and the angel finally comes and says, Daniel, you consistently prayed and it took me so long to get here because I was held up with the prince of Persia of the air. There was things going on that needed to be completed first before this thing can move forward. Sometimes we want blessings out of timing. We want things now because that's all we can fix our eyes on. But Jesus is saying, look, this really only works after this. Don't start your car without oil. You're just going to burn the engine. It'll pop off. It'll start. And the whole thing will explode. So I can't give you this. I need you to continue to pray for it and wait for it. Pray for it and wait for it. I'm not showing you sin in your life. I'm not showing you where... I'm leading you to grow you in some area other than I just need you to be faithful. I need you to learn to continue to trust in me even when there's no sound of my voice on the issue. Luke 18 talks about the widow that goes to the unjust king begging for justice. And this idea of she continues to just pound for her case, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. There's nothing saying the justice she wants is wrong or that the king uh, shouldn't give it or she needs to learn a lesson. Jesus just says, hey, look, you got to continue to come to your father. You don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We have such a small view of eternity and such a small view of God and what he's doing that sometimes it's just the continuous prayer. And he's trying to develop perseverance in our lives so that we will relentlessly pursue something. We will pursue something until we're so hungry it's the only thing we look for. God wants us to be people who are hungry for His promises, hungry for His presence, and the only way you get hungry is by eating. You starve unto death, but the more you eat, the hungrier you get. Maybe not in the moment, but the appetite grows. The appetite grows. And the appetite grows. In the physical, this is a real problem. In the spiritual with God, this is a huge blessing. And So sometimes God's trying to de- develop a deeper hunger, a burden that we cannot release until God does something in prayer. And He's calling us to persist, to persist, cease without praying, pray without ceasing, always praying, always seeking, always striving for the goodness of God. Oftentimes, those prayers that need continuous prayers because there is something very spiritual going on, like I mentioned. That's point number five, spiritual warfare. 
And sometimes we're fighting the wrong battle. There's a disease, there's, there's an issue, there's a mental illness, there's lack of finances, there's things, and we're praying for things in the natural that we understand, but we need to stop and understand that we have a very real enemy who is seeking to destroy us, who is prowling around like a roaring lion looking to devour us, who has come to steal, kill, and destroy us. And if we give him a foothold, he has the ability to wreak absolute havoc on our life and create a firestorm of us getting looking at the natural so that we no longer see God working in the supernatural. And our prayers become about natural things when they need to be about spiritual things. We see ailment and we fight for healing, but it's not the body that's sick, it's the spirit, and the the infirmity of the body will leave the second the spirit leaves. And our prayers have to be sensitive. We need to be calling out to God, God, what is it at hand here? What is it that is going on? Again, Peter talks about this idea of being resisting the devil, being sober-minded, having your mind clear. And Paul talks about it in Romans 2. And I have this, and this is where the verses will start kicking up on the screen. Romans 2, 12, 2. I'm sorry, Romans 12, 2. Sorry. The renewing of the mind. Do not be conformed to this world. You see, the patterns of the world are the patterns of Satan. The way he works, the natural things are the things of the enemy. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Hebrews talks about going from milk to meat, being able to discern the difference between good and evil. This is a spiritual thing, not a natural thing. This is a very spiritual thing of going, having the Lord show you and teach you what it means to pray in the Spirit so that you can see things for what they truly are. Sometimes sickness is sickness. We see this when Jesus heals, and sometimes sickness is demonic, even in a believer. I might be a little controversial. Jesus never said demons don't attack believers. He said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, I think a sick Christian is pretty broken in their home, don't you? A Christian with mental illness is not operating at the fullness of the house that God called them to hold the Holy Spirit in. A Christian with demonic influence can have mental illness, physical sickness. The house isn't standing as it should. And so our prayers can't just be about what we see and experience in the flesh. They must be about spiritual things and the realities that are going on. The wrestling that we do that is not flesh and blood, but of principalities of darkness in the air. All right. The last one. Knowing your authority. Faith in His Word about what He says about you over your experience or your gifts. Faith in His Word about what He says about you over your experience or your gifts. Sometimes we don't pray in faith because we are too busy looking at our lack and not God's abundance. We see ourselves as weak and inferior. The the, the truth of our sin that needed salvation lingers in a lie that we are still completely broken, useless people. Well, were you made in the image of God or not? I'm pretty sure the Bible's pretty clear about that, that you were made in the image of God, fearfully woven in your mother's womb. That God's design of who you are and the plans He has for your life are perfect. And in this world, we attach to sin, we attach to things, and we let the enemy take our fallen nature, the sinful nature that Christ paid for. He shed His blood on the cross. Our our entire nature was crucified, dead, and we'll rise alive with Him in the Spirit. Romans 8.11 says, The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will give your life, your bodies, life now. Now. Sometimes our prayers fall short of working because we are too busy seeing our lack and not seeing the abundance of our Creator. Romans 8.14.17 For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. That we suffer with Him. That we train with Him, that we get disciplined by Him, that we allow Him to 
chastise us as Jesus went through. Hebrews talks about he learned obedience. There's a hard concept to swallow. The God of the universe learning obedience. Furthermore, Romans 5, 2 through 5 says this concerning the same spirit. Through him we have also been obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This love has been poured into our hearts. This is what He thinks about you. This is who you are. You are loved by your Father. And it is his desire for you to know that more and more. Paul wrote the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, concerning this love that he has for us. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, it surpasses your understanding, it surpasses the natural way of thinking things, the amount of love God has for you can't even be explained or expressed. God loves you so much, and if He gave His very Son for you, how much more will He not give you all things that you need to accomplish the very things that you are crying out for? If we are receiving the will of God in our life, if we are allowing Jesus because we're pursuing the relationship with Him, not just answers, but the relationship with Him, for Him to be to to possess our minds and our hearts with His will and His desires, how much more when we speak that very thing that He has spoken from heaven to us, will He not fulfill the very word that He called forth in us? He wants to move. He wants to move, but He's waiting for a people who will call out His name. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. Ambassadors of the gospel of the goodness, more than conquerors, heirs, sons and daughters, friends, beloved children, royal priests, holy nation, his prized possession. If he didn't spare Jesus, again, if he didn't spare Jesus, how much more is he willing to give? This is our faith that we have when we pray. It's not only who Jesus is, but who he says we are. Gives us the boldness to stand before God and claim his promises for ourselves. Not because we're great or we deserve it, but because of what he says about who we are. It is in his heart to meet our needs, but it is his need for us to meet him in his heart. It is in his heart to meet our needs, but it is his need for us to meet in his heart. When he doesn't answer us, It's because we need to pursue Him more. All the answers of our cries, everything that we're crying out for that we want revelation on, they are all found in the person of Jesus Christ. They are all found by the revelation of the Holy Spirit of who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in us. And they are all found in Him through intimacy. Like I said earlier, quoting Pastor Mike, God does not always more than one thing with one thing. He's always working some discipline, some perseverance. There might be spiritual warfare that's, that's causing some of it. There might be some sin that allowed that. Spirit. There could be, a, there is always, it's, it's not just one thing. This is not a formula to be like, okay, Jesus, I'm going to go down the line. But I just wanted to lay a foundation tonight for us to understand that when God's not answering, it's not because he doesn't care. He's drawing us deeper into himself. He's always teaching us something so that we don't just isolate a prayer off to the side and say, look, this, this just isn't happening. It's not God's will or God's desire. How much we don't even understand the things that he has hidden for us, that if we would just search him, not the things, but him, that he would willingly expose. It's the glory of God to hide things, but the glory of kings to seek them out. This is a hard lesson for me right now because disappointment has been just running rampant on me lately in this area. And I feel like the God, God said, don't let the enemy destroy you with disappointment. Disappointment leads to doubt. Doubt is the antithesis of faith. 
your disappointment in the enemy's hands will lead to faith being killed by the doubt. Don't let the enemy destroy you with disappointment. Be honest as you seek the Lord. Be honest when you cast your anxieties on Him because He is faithful. He is good. He is loving and He is more than able to overcome. And I want to close with this idea. We're, we're not going to pray tonight. I'm going long. I already told Chris I was going long. I, I didn't know we were doing the youth thing, which was awesome. I didn't realize it's going to take that long to get through announcements today. Um, Matthew 7. Verse 7 through 11. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And we, and we read in Luke a while back that Jesus is speaking to specifically of the Holy Spirit. He says something, though, about children. How many will give your children? You see, the idea of being a child in that idea of what Jesus is talking about is, is if you're a legitimate child, you're an obedient child. If you're a child, you're obedient. You're legitimate by the training of His grace. You're a child that loves the Father, His ways, and His will. And He's calling us His children to pour out ourselves, to ask, to seek, to knock. And I want to just, as we're pursuing the Lord and His answers in life, to ask to see His face, to ask to know Him more, and He will answer. to do it in honesty and humility with wherever your frustrations are at, to pour your heart out before God on the things that you're struggling with, the things that you're frustrated with, the things that just don't seem to stink and go away. To ask Him to show His face first. And then to pursue Him for the intimacy that He wants to have with you. To pursue, to seek Him out for intimacy's sake. To ask to see Him and to know Him, to know His will and His ways, and then to seek him out for intimacy. This is what it crushed me today uh, at, at men's breakfast yesterday. Thomas talked about um, uh, sowing seeds, and it really had nothing, but the Lord just showed me it's like, you don't know how to sow seeds of intimacy. And it broke my heart. Intimacy doesn't really care what the situation looks like or what is going on around you. You just care about the person you're with. And the Lord was saying, you don't know how to have intimacy with me. And thus, you don't really know how to have great intimacy with your wife either. Because your mind's always on what's going on. What needs to be done. What hasn't been done. Can you be intimate? Will you seek me for intimacy? And finally, the knock. And when God reveals whatever He reveals, whatever He reveals, no matter if it's the opposite of what you're asking for, will you knock? Will you walk in faith? in that direction. And I believe God will pour out more of His blessing on us. We'll hear God's voice more clearly and we'll start to see Him answer more succinctly because our hearts will be turned to, to know all of Him. Children of God, it is in His heart to answer our prayers, but it is His need it is his need for our prayers to seek his heart. So before I pray us out, no, I'm just, I was going to share. I'm just, I don't have time to share. That's okay. I don't want to cry anymore anyways. I'm just going to you close your eyes. I'm going to read Psalm 27 slowly as the prayer, and then I'm just going to end it with an amen, and we're going to be done. And when we're done, Jason and Andrew are going to be over here to pray for you. If you want prayer for anything, if you want to join up in prayer, be over there. Uh, but I just want you to close your eyes, because if I believe Psalm 27, there's so much of the heart of God being sought out here. Um, to just when God isn't moving right away, to just see the different facets of everything we talked about in this psalm is a beautiful thing. So if at any point I'm praying part of this scripture, and you feel like that's me, Lord, just tune me out. 
and just do some time with Jesus. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to read this emphatically, deliberately, and slowly. I don't know what any of those words mean. <laughs> Just sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. O oh, one thing have I asked for of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under cover of His tent. And He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face, and my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. O Lord, hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not. O God of my salvation. My father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord, the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. But I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm so sorry. Please go save our city kid workers with your kids. If you have children, go get them now. Get them now. They work so hard down there. You don't want to burden with anything more. I love you guys. We love you guys. Again, if you want prayer, Jason and Andrew will be over here to pray for people. Be blessed and we'll see you next week.